Iran is 4,500 times bigger than the Gaza Strip. 4,500 times. Not only that, this is not flat sandy beaches. This is mountainous terrain that have underneath those mountains hundreds of meters into the earth underground cities of bunker network subterranean tunnel systems that are impervious to nuclear weapons. They have 40 times the population of the Gaza Strip. They have twice the population of Afghanistan or Iraq. They have a modern military, one of the largest in the world, in fact, in terms of manpower, and they certainly have one of the largest in the world when it comes to the amount of reserves that they could mobilize. They have, uh, they're have run by a theocracy, so they have uh, the benefit of being a culturally and religiously homogenous society. They have possible nuclear weapons, or they could easily cross the nuclear threshold in a relatively short period of time. And that is something that is confirmed by Western intelligence analysts, as well as the Ayatollah himself and his scientists. They have heavy-hitting allies that, of course, are our sworn enemies that all possess nuclear weapons. North Korea, China, and Russia, of course, for which they have military partnerships with and quite possibly are under some nuclear umbrella. The idea that the Israelis, who struggled with the little old 140 square mile Gaza Strip and had to annihilate scores of civilians in the process and are still struggling to this day and haven't finished a job and probably won't for another year or so if they ever do because they can't fight a war on two fronts because they simply don't have the manpower to do it okay the idea that israel is going to go to war and even america the idea that either of these countries are going to go to war even america with its lauded expeditionary forces that have never completely been able to win the hearts and minds of the people in the countries that they've attempted to conquer, to think that they are going to have any success in crippling the Iranian regime is absolutely preposterous. It is not only absurd, it is complete and utter insanity. The only thing that is going to happen is that they're going to set up the conditions so that Iran is forced to, well, Israel's going to open the Pandora's box when they do their retaliatory strikes against Iran, and that could come at any time. We just don't know when it's going to happen. I don't even know if it's going to happen, but I think it likely will because they're that crazy and they make no mistake, they want to start a war with Iran. But it's not going to be a ground war because that's an impossibility. They need a justification to use a nuclear weapon, or as they're going to call it, an E-bomb. That's what they're calling it. I read you guys an article last time where they were framing it as an E-bomb. Any atomic bomb, any nuclear bomb, has as a residual effect an electromagnetic pulse that essentially can fry power grids uh, within the line of sight of the detonation. Okay, So if you detonate it at a high altitude, it's going to fry the electronics of everything in the line of sight. This has been confirmed by Starfish Prime experiments, uh, Operation Dominic, and so it's been confirmed that it's going to fry it over a wide region. So what they might do, because they're framing it in such a way, they're framing it as this is an electromagnetic pulse weapon with a residual nuclear effect. And because they know the public is incredibly naive and distracted just trying to work two jobs to make ends meet right now, which I can sympathize with, or I could have at least at one point in time, even though I work now more than I ever did when I work for somebody else. The idea that they're going to be able to do anything short of that, to have any sort of substantial impact without creating complete global economic chaos is incredibly naive. Now, there was an article that was written in 2009. This is from a think tank. A friend just sent me this. This is from the Brookings Institute. Okay, we're going to get to the daily news of the day because everybody's probably on edge wondering what the hell is going to happen next. I'm going to do the best of my capability, try to break it all down. But here's an expert from this think tank back in 2009. This was around seven years after the Millennium Challenge exercise where the U.S. determined that it would likely lose a war with Iran. I mean, even then, okay, when Iran was incredibly weak militarily. Anyways, here's an excerpt from that. The truth is, 
that all of these would be challenging cases to make. For that reason, it would be far more preferable and this is not taken out of context. You can go and read the whole PDF, okay? I can't remember what it's called. Just look for Brookings Institute. It's a uh, project for a new American century for Persia or something like that. I'll post a link in the description if I remember. I'll try to. You guys pester me if I don't. For that reason, it would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian provocation as justification for the airstrikes before launching them. Clearly, the more outrageous, the more deadly, and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States would be. Of course, it would be very difficult for the United States to go to Iran into such a provocation without the rest of the world recognizing this game, which would then undermine it. Now, they're positing hypotheticals here, as was the German article referenced by Bild that predicted that war with Russia could break out before the year's end. And this is why Steadfast Defender and Russia and Ukraine hasn't calmed down at all right now. Uh, the, the attention that's being taken away, though, is quite telling. Notice how overnight nobody is talking about Hamas. Nobody is really even talking about Hezbollah. Nobody is talking about Ukraine. And all the NAFO guys are starved for attention once again. And they're wondering what to do with their pathetic lives. Everybody is talking about Iran overnight. And remember, I warned you about this on January 30th. In fact, I've been warning you about this since the collapse of the nuclear deal in 2022. The wheels of this have been in motion. In fact, Zirinovsky, the Russian pundit, predicted, and he, this is the guy who predicted to the day when the Ukraine war would start. To the day, okay? This was the only guy that Putin would allow to scream in his face in disagreement because he respected him that much. He also predicts that this year an Iranian war is going to start and it is going to completely overshadow everything that has happened in Ukraine and that the horrors of this coming war in Iran are going to make the Ukraine war seem like a low intensity conflict that we are going to see things that we've never seen before. We're talking about the Gaza Strip on a massive scale. This is the only type of war Israel is going to be able to wage against the Iranians if they can penetrate the Iranian defense. He also predicted that there might not be an election this year in 2024. Now, you would have asked me a few years ago, I would have said, that's nonsense. That's impossible. I still think it's very unlikely that we're not going to see an election. I think you would have to see some major, major events. We're talking about a nuclear weapon being used for there potentially not to be an election. This is not to say this wasn't foreshadowed in uh, the movie that just came out, Civil War. Only uh, that election didn't happen because, well, they don't really say why it didn't happen. But the guy was serving a third term and Biden's still only on his first term. So I guess that wouldn't really fly. But uh, regardless, uh, you know, the people have been primed for this now with the whole predictive programming thing. So I would not be surprised if, well, I, I certainly I predict that there will be a war with Iran this year, without a doubt. What that war is going to look like is another story. Something is going to have to happen that is so heinous and so egregious to the international community that is going to garner the support for a war with Iran. Now, there is a, a underlying dislike of the Iranians in the United States, I'd say more so than the Russians, particularly on the right, not necessarily on the left. Um, there's just, you know, a natural bias towards people in the Middle East. It's been indoctrinated. Uh, you know, through Hollywood, through the 1970s. So there's just a bias towards Middle Eastern people. So the Americans are likely more easily going to acquiesce. And I'm not saying you guys, I'm not saying, and Canadians as well, we're going to more easily acquiesce to a war being fought with Iran, for starters, because we unconsciously believe we can win it. But this is not going to be Afghanistan. This is not going to be Iraq. These guys have been tucked away in isolation sanctioned off from the rest of the world, preparing for this eventuality for 30, 40 years. I mean, every, I mean, think about it. When you got nothing to do but dig, and I said the same thing about the North Koreans, 
You can drop as many nukes as you want in North Korea. You are never going to get deep enough to take them out. That's how deep these guys are dug in. They got nothing left to do but dig. When you cut a nation off from the rest of the world, you know what you do? It's basically like sending a man out into the wilderness. And if he survives and you come back years later and he's still alive, you know how strong that guy is going to be? I mean, to survive what all of these nations have survived with our onslaught of sanctions and isolationism, you know, you have to become incredibly, like you got to do everything vertically. You got to build everything from the ground up. You got to be incredibly resourceful. You have to have tough people, not a bunch of softies with blue hair. And that's just fact of the matter. We have the luxury of being able to dye our hair and choose our identity. And I have no problem with that, but I'm just saying this is a luxury that is quickly going to go by the wayside when shit gets real. Remember that. Gold, right now, hovering around 2400 bucks. What a surprise. Silver, over $29, at least the last time I checked. That one is a little bit more volatile. There are concerns that the reason why, and think about this. The fact that Iran retaliated in the first place says a lot. That's a testament to how weak we are being perceived around the world how weak we've become. I mean, nothing bodes the end for the petrodollar, quite like the Iranians attacking Israel with the largest onslaught of drones and missiles in history. Okay? Now, people are thinking that it's quite possible that the Iranians already have nuclear weapons and that this was the reason why they had the gall in order to, to do this, to attack Israel in such a way. The Iranian strike on Israel raises questions about the potential nuclear capability. We've been reporting on this capability for several years. Everybody thinks that they could easily, you know, because they have the enriched uranium, or they could easily have the enriched uranium within a short period of time, they have the delivery system, and they have the know-how. So as long as you have those three things and you're doing it in a bunker that is impervious to any sort of attack, you can have a nuclear weapon. The Israeli army is preparing for a retaliatory strike. They say that it is confirmed. Now, they're also trying to say now that they're going to create anxiety amongst the Iranians just in the same way that the Iranians did to them. But the reason why the Iranians waited 12 days was to telegraph and to give them forewarning in order to provide a de-escalatory off-ramp to say, hey, we have the capability to drop a bunch of ballistic missiles on your military bases, and these are uh, some of the cruise missiles that hit, incredibly maneuverable, like last-minute, you know, microsecond maneuvers, and you can see it on film, the thing turns and, and course corrects to hit its target. And they, with pinpoint precision, the Iranian missiles have pinpoint precision. We've seen this after the Soleimani uh, assassination. They murked American bases like you could not have centered that missile, that warhead, on that military base better than they did. So they have that capability. And they are using a lot of their old stock. You already have these idiots coming out of the woodwork saying, I think that's all they have left. This is the biggest uh, attack they're going to be able to muster. You think so? I mean, you know, people are so dumb. And remember, a Shahid drone that cost $20,000 to make, for them it probably costs like ten grand because they don't have this bloated military industrial complex. A Shahid drone that's $10,000 that is hit by multiple interceptors that costs probably all told half a million dollars because that's what it's going to take to make the new ones because we're in an inflationary environment and you know you got all these labor standards which are great but you know they don't have those problems in Iran and other places where they can build these things cheap plus you got the manpower you got all the staffing so to fire these missiles a Shahid drone being intercepted is a hit because you just took out something that cost probably 20 times as much. Remember that. <sighs> the Iranian attack, and I can tell you right now that all these propagandists on social media, they're all starting 
to toe the line that John Bolton is starting to lay down here, which is that we need to stop the Iranians from getting a nuclear weapon. All of this was laid down in House Resolution 559. Now, all of them in unison are all focused on Iran, all of a sudden in Iran's nuclear program. There is suspicions, though, that they already have nuclear weapons. Now, if that's true, Israel isn't much. I think Israel is like one-tenth the size of Iran. And this is flat, and a lot of it is West Bank, Gaza Strip, in hostile territory. A lot of it is just unoccupied desert. Much is the case with Iran, but Iran has geographical barriers. Like, they got mountains that are impossible to, you know, bring tanks over and, and bring an army over. I mean, it's Tehran is is perfectly situated far away from U.S. capabilities to, to try to uh, do any sort of uh, invasive ground-based maneuver. Like, it would be impossible. First, you'd have to go through Iraq, I guess. Maybe you could go through Turkey. Maybe that's what the plan is going to be. It's possible. That's the only way. If you get Turkey involved, maybe you get Egypt involved. Other than that, there's no way you're going to have the manpower to take out Iran. But trust me, the spoils of taking out Iran are massive. Because number one, you shut down China. You shut down China's capability, because that's going to be their lifeline in the future, if Russia goes offline. But it also gives them a bit of leverage, right? Because then they can buy the Russian crude, they can buy the Iranian crude. And uh, what else was I going to say? You... It's beneficial to the Chinese because, of course, it's just another bulwark on one of their flanks. It's, uh, it's another way to keep the Americans occupied, essentially. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine made an interesting comparison. He, he, he said it's a lot like right now the United States is like a bull. And you have a bunch of different matadors and clowns running around a field. And the bull is being, you know, led one way and then it's being led the other. Like, it's like the Houthis, it's Hamas, it's Iran, it's, it's Russia. You know, China is going to start doing some stuff. North Korea is going to start doing some stuff. So this is clearly coordinated at a high level. This is World War III. Just like Andrew Bustamante said, former CIA spy, when he was on here, he said that World War III started back in 9-11. It's just being waged on a proxy level because nobody wants to use nukes. But it's getting to the point where when you run out of conventional weapons and when you've reached a point where uh, you reach the point of Thucydides trap where it's make or break and either the up and coming superpower is going to supplant you as being the superpower, that's when you might see an incident where maybe we just don't make it through that great filter, okay? Maybe we, this is how it happens where the United States and Israel and its other uh, vassal states are so committed to holding on to power and not letting the Iranian, Russian, Chinese, North Korean, and all the other smaller satellite countries involved, they're so committed to not letting them take the reins of power that they will use nuclear weapons, okay? So that, you know, the tables cannot turn. Now, even if Biden doesn't start a war with Iran, Trump will carry the torch and start that war with Iran. This will be Trump's war if there are no elections canceled and if the Zirinovsky prediction doesn't come true. Zirinovsky, of course, Russian pundit, claimed, predicted to the day that the Ukrainians were going to get into a war with the Russians on February 22nd. This guy, like I said, was the only guy that Vladimir Putin would allow to shout loudly or that felt comfortable enough because he didn't give a shit and Vladimir Putin let him say his piece every single time. He predicts that the Iranian war is going to be one of the most bloody wars that we've ever seen and it's going to cause the cancellation of the elections. Now, like I say, I don't know if that's true. It's being telegraphed in the, in the movie Civil War that I have a review on coming up soon, and I assure you that uh, my thousand-foot perspective of that movie is something that you're not going to hear anywhere else. When I watch a apocalyptic movie, I watch it several times, and I, because I've, you know, this is my favorite genre of film, I always give them a lot more credit, and I can tell you that there's a lot more symbolism in that movie that a lot of people simply aren't seeing, and I'm talking about big, big symbolism, okay? 
Israel is now playing it smart, it would appear. However, they're playing it smart in terms of delaying their response. This notion that Biden and Netanyahu are on different pages, this is a false dichotomy, okay? If the Biden administration or the U.S. government, period, or any of the other parties involved here, France, the U.K., essentially NATO, if any of these guys were really trying to back Netanyahu off of a retaliatory strike, they would simply pull funding. They wouldn't be trying to fast track a bill through the House this week that was going to give them another $18 billion and the fighter jets they're going to need to make the trip. These F-15X fighter jets. They wouldn't be providing the training, the, the backup, okay, the defensive backup. They wouldn't be uh, providing the, possibly even the pilots, okay, the ammunition, okay? So don't tell me that, you know, there's, you know, that, oh, Biden is putting pressure on, no, 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 not the farthest thing is true. I just read you the Brookings Institute's um, think tank's paper that they wrote in 2009 that documented all of their little machinations. So th there's no possibility that they're on different sides. They want a war with Iran because the spoils, that's what I forgot to say, the spoils of Iran, I mean, the prize, if you can get that Iranian oil, that's a massive prize. Not that they're ever going to be able to, I mean, they couldn't lock down Iraq, for Christ's sakes. They couldn't lock down Afghan. They can't beat the Yemenis. And the Yemenis have a very similar territory. This is why they've never entered. They've only done airstrikes. They simply can't do anything about it. Now, sure, the Yemeni drones are going to miss the warships 99.9% .9 of the time, but it's a hit because that warship just fired a missile that cost 20 times the amount. So little old guys with sandals uh, lighting their, their cigarettes on, uh, I seen one guy, he, what did he do? He, he lit his cigarette by shooting a bullet and causing a spark or something crazy like that. And I, anyways, these guys are crazy, okay? They're the honey badgers of the Middle East. They do not give a F-U-C-K. They can't defeat them, yet you really think you're gonna defeat a country. And you got guys who, I don't know, I think they just think they're so used to not fighting a peer adversary. They're just bloodthirsty. They're cowards because they would never go to war. And this is why a lot of these guys who are vying for, um, who are advocating for a war with the Iranians, this is why they're, they're also, they usually tend to be not pro-Russian, but against the war with the Russians, because they know they'd get their ass kicked. But little do they know, they're gonna get their ass kicked in Iran as well. You can drop as many bombs as you want, and you're gonna, all you're going to do is you're just gonna create, you know, droves of militants. If you do what you tried to do in Gaza, in Iran, not only is Russia gonna get involved eventually, they're gonna have to, because Iran is providing Russia support military support, not only is China going to get involved, they're going to have to. And this is when you start getting China destabilized. Joel Skousen predicted when he was on the channel recently, he said, Ukraine's not going to go nuclear yet, or it could, but it, it's, it's, you know, he, he didn't think that worldwide nuclear war would ensue over Ukraine. He thinks it's going to ensue over China, but he thinks that a regional war is going to start first with the Iranians. Okay, and uh, so basically the same thing that Zirinovsky was saying. First it starts in Europe, then it spreads to the Middle East, then it spreads to Asia, then it's full-blown SHTF. You know, I'm doing this video tonight, and for all I know, Israel is already launching their retaliatory strike, opening Pandora's box, and once they do that, okay, <sighs> Iran launching their attack in a very calculated, strategic way telegraphing it for 12 days, saying, hey, we're going to do this. We're doing this in response. We need some optics here to calm down some of the hawks. And, uh, but if the Israelis do do something big, and they're saying that it's going to be disproportionate, as it typically is, okay? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. This is what they do, disproportionate. Some people would say, well, that's the strategy you have to take if you want to win. But, I mean, they're not winning. And you're certainly not going to win that way with Iran. I mean, you can, if you start dropping bombs on Tehran, that's it. You are going to wake up a monster, okay? Because you have to understand that even if you presume that Iran is technologically 
inferior. They're allies with countries who are not. And they're sharing information with the Russians who happen to have radar and equipment inside Syria that can see into Israel. Okay, so anyways, Benjamin Netanyahu supposedly hasn't been answering his phone. The Israeli prime minister has reportedly refused several phone calls over the last 48 hours. See, they got to do this to create this illusion of false dichotomy that the Bidens and the, you know, and all these people can't get a hold of Netanyahu. Well, if that was true, all they got to say is, hey, if you don't answer the damn phone, we're going to cut your funding. Watch how quick BB rocks the mic. And again, like I said, the fact that Iran is fighting back at all is a sign that the petrodollars days are numbered. What's oil trading at? 86 or something like that? You know these markets are so manipulated. You know, today there was like this pink cloud syndrome in the morning. Iran, literally, something that, I mean, I cannot, you know, 10 years ago, if that were to happen, I mean, it would have been, the markets would have crashed. It would have been massive news. Today, Monday morning, the markets open green, <laughs> green. <laughs> All you can do is laugh, man, because it's just, it's insanity. Iran's foreign uh, minister has said that if Israel makes another mistake, it won't have 12 days. It's not going to afford them that luxury of having those 12 days to prepare and get their population into the bunkers and loading up on food. No, it's going to respond in seconds citing that they're going to use a weapon that they've never used, which likely is going to be hypersonic weapons. Now, some people are using this to say that, well, maybe they're going to use a nuclear weapon. They're not going to go there yet. That's not going to happen. Um, these guys, you know, they practice the same measured art of war, managed escalation policy that the Russians and the Chinese do. A friend of mine was telling me that they take 100 years to weave certain Persian rugs. Okay, 100 years. And see, these countries, they can do that because they have a supreme leader. And because of that, you can think the long game. You can play the long game. We can't do that here in the West because we have these four-year terms. And quite frankly, at some point, um, maybe we're just going to be forced to become an authoritarian regime, because that's going to be the only thing that gets us back on track. It sounds crazy to say, but when you're so myopic and you're just trying to get reelected once again, and you put the, the near-term future ahead of the, the interests of the long-term future, then you're never going to get ahead. That's a losing battle. You're basically uh, riding on the achievements of your predecessors, the technological achievements that all the rest of the world are finally catching up. We have closures of Iranian embassies. We have flights being suspended to Tel Aviv. Iran has also threatened neighboring Jordan. If Jordan continues to participate in the Zionist aggression against Iran and its allies, Jordan will be directly targeted. Netanyahu is summoning the opposition for a meeting for a briefing at the IDF headquarters in Tel Aviv, possibly ahead of retaliation against Iran to make sure that everybody is on the same page. The International Atomic Energy Agency has said, uh, the director has said that there's ongoing concern that Iran's nuclear facilities might be struck. Really, is there a big concern? Have you heard that? Anything about that on, you know how they're making this big deal out of Zaporozhia, right? The nuclear power plant in Ukraine. I mean, everywhere you're hearing, and it's the Ukrainians who are the ones that are attacking it. Obviously, you can say that now. It's within the Overton window to say that. Because, of course, it's, it's passe to talk about Ukraine. Uh, it won't be in a few weeks. I, I think that, you know, if this situation stabilizes, which I highly suspect it might for a while, but, you know, medium to long term, it's not stabilizing. This is going full blown. But if it does stabilize, we're going to go back to Ukraine talking about that, you know, in good order. But uh, isn't that a contradiction? The hypocrisy of saying, well, you know, calling all this attention to the Z ZNPP and just being completely dismissive of the fact that you, you might, you, you're literally enabling them to do a radiological event in Iran. Because you know there's going to be fissionable material there. They're going to strike it with bombs that are much bigger 
than uh, these drones and stuff that are hitting uh, the ZNPP. And th these facilities, I mean, while they're underground, a lot of them, still, I mean, the principle should be there. This should be something that is gaining international attention, but it isn't. Uh, just a bit, if I don't, I might forget about this. I accidentally put this uh, blurb about the Ukraine conflict in with my notes about the Middle East. But apparently the French got hit in Slavyansk. Remember we reported that there were a hundred French, a uh, hundred of the French legion there just recently? Well, apparently the Russian armed forces hit the location of the French mercenaries in Slavyansk, controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine, the coordinator of the Nikolaev underground, Sergei Lebevev, told Ria Novosti, citing colleagues. Now, Ria Novosti, yes, it's kind of the equivalent of like, uh, what would we say? I don't know. I don't know what a valid comparison. One of those kind of peripheral mainstream agencies. It's not entirely mainstream. That's a little bit OPED. Uh, but anyways, uh, there's probably, where there's smoke, there's fire there. I would not be surprised if there was some truth to that. The Defense Minister Gallant of Israel has said that the IDF can go ahead and prep for the assault on Rafah. So they still got this stuff to deal with in Rafah. They still got the stuff to deal with on the northern border. I mean, these guys are stretched way too thin. The USA is also contemplating now, you have Senator James Lankford saying that there's no reason to have the Iranian foreign minister on American soil to allow them to have a platform in America while they are holding Americans hostage and attacking our allies. A terrible idea. Well, number one, it's not the Iranians who are holding the Israelis hostage. It's not. In fact, the Hamas and uh, the Persians, okay, the Persians and the Arab Hamas, they were at war with each other and they, they were fighting with one another, okay? The whole Sunni Shiite divide. But, you know, it doesn't stop us from lumping them all into one basket and saying, well, if they're Middle Eastern and they're not Israeli, then they must all be the same. They all look alike, right? But, uh, I mean, this is the kind of immature diplomatic policy that ensures our demise. This, this type of ignorant diplomacy and bluster is what is going to ensure that we are dethroned as the global uh, hegemon. Rishi Sunak warns, Iran's nuclear problem or nuclear program never been more advanced amidst fears of Israeli conflict escalating. Now, he said this right after he supposedly was pressuring Netanyahu. Okay, so you see, speaking out of both sides of their mouth. On the one hand, they're providing the justification that is required for Israel to do some sort of airstrikes, and on the other side, they're saying, "Oh, please don't do it because we don't need a war." Trust me, they need a war. Like Salente says, that one video that we recently released, where it has now been demonetized, by the way. What a surprise that my uh, Salente videos and my Skousen videos get demonetized. Those are the only ones. What a surprise. Anyways, like he says, when all else fails, they take you to war. The Iranians have said, under no uncertain terms, if American military bases in Jordan continue to participate in the Zionist aggression against Iran and its allies, we will strike them. Now, I'm not a fanboy of the Iranian theocracy. I'm not a Muslim, okay? But I just respect the capabilities of our adversary. And I think there was a time when we probably did that. And that's why we actually won wars. But, so when I say this, I'm not like one of these people who, and I know it seems that way because there's a lot of people who just kind of get off on trash talking the West. And I've never been that kind of person. I've always tried to provide you an even killed analysis, but it's getting to the point where our, our ignorance needs to be called out because it's going to get us killed. It's like a child who is running out into traffic. You got to rein him in sometimes, okay? And you got to say, what the heck? And uh, according to him, uh, negotiations, are, uh, negotiations are underway on this initiative, including with the NATO representatives. In fact, this would protect NATO countries from Russian missiles. Blah, blah, blah. Anyways, uh, basically, they're saying that we're going to strike your military bases throughout the region that are largely defenseless against an attack like the one that was uh, levied against the, the uh, Israelis with that massive salvo of missiles. They're saying that you're going to get your, miss your bases destroyed. Now, maybe this is exactly what Israel wants. And, of course, what this is going to do then, it's going to give them incentive to create a situation like a 
Gulf of Tonkin, um, uh, USS Liberty type situation where they, if they can bring the United States into the conflict, be it by a refueling plane or an AWACS plane or something that is enabling the Israelis to do whatever strikes they're about to do, that's going to be the first target of the Iranians. It's going to be because, you know, I mean, they might not have success in targeting the, the jets, the fighter jets. So they're going to go for the airports. They're going to go for the places where the planes are taking off from. They're going to go for the supply lines. And that's where you're going to have American soldiers doing support. Because they're not bound by this whole Article 5 nonsense that's going on in Ukraine. And Ukraine, by the way, is incredibly pissed. Because they're seeing all the NATO countries coming to the aid of Israel <laughs> you know, because let's face it, we're cowards. You know, we, we, well, we're not, it's not that we're cowards. We're smart when it comes to fighting the Russians, but we're underestimating the Iranians. So now the Ukrainians are threatening outright. And I said this before, a few weeks ago, um, their uh, foreign minister Kaluba is saying that we have to think about our own interests. If your partners say we are giving you seven Patriot missile batteries tomorrow, but we ask do not do this and this. What they mean is do not attack Russia because we don't want the price of oil to continue to skyrocket. Then they say they would be willing to cooperate. However, there is no help package. And at the same time, you're asked to do something. What should we do about it? They're basically implying that they're going to continue with the drone strikes on Russian oil refineries, which is going to continue to drive the price of oil higher and higher forcing the depletion of the strategic oil reserve, forcing inflation to continue to rise, that I'm convinced at this point is a foregone conclusion that the Biden administration is going to be forced to just, you know, capitulate on the economy. And they're going to have to go for broke. So if you know the economy is not going to get fixed between now and then, the only other possibility is a war. That's the only other way that he can stay in power. If we even think that, you know, the Hegelian dialectic of the left versus right, I don't really buy into that. I don't think politics. Politics is for the birds. It's what they give the masses. At the top, there is no left or right. There's just a lot of guys making a lot of money. Poland is talking about protecting Ukraine. Ukraine and Poland are considering the scenario of protecting the Western Ukraine regions with Pol Polish Patriot systems, said Kaluba. Mind you, this is the same guy who's been saying that they're going to get tourist missiles for the last year. Now, eventually, all this could come at the same time. Once the F-16s get there, that's when all of this comes together. Okay, so they're just putting all the pieces in motion. Steadfast defender going full swing, moving what from one exercise to another, getting all the systems set up so that when, if and when the Ukrainian line collapses, uh, I heard that the there's rumors that the Russians are getting ready to do another mobilization. And what I'll say is where there's smoke, there's fire. They are saying right now that there's no need to do it. There's no tactical reason to do it, and there's no imminent threat from NATO to do it, that those would be the reasons in order to do it. But just like prior to the, what was it called? What did they call it? A partial mobilization? I can't remember exactly what they called it, but it was like, you know, it was a mobilization. They mobilized 300,000 guys. In any other country, that would be massive, but they called it a partial mobilization. And uh, before that, two weeks before that, you know, we were saying, I was saying the mobilization is coming. I made a video like four days before that. I said, it's confirmed. The mobilization is coming. Everybody said, you're full of shit. Sure enough, the mobilization happened. I think they're doing the same thing now because the reason why they would mobilize is if NATO was getting ready to do some crazy stuff with these F-16s bringing this in. And I know the F-16s in itself is not a game changer, but it's because in order to use that technology, you have to have the whole suite of things. You have to, there's a whole other um, uh, infrastructure that is built around it that necessitates a higher level of NATO involvement, which would mean that this would likely bring NATO face to face with the Russians, which might be the trigger for mobilization. So this is probably why. Now the Russians are denying it, but you can't trust the Russians, guys. You can't. You can't trust the Russians as much as you can't trust our own leaders. You can't trust any leaders because, of course, they got to tell what they believe is the noble lie, that lie to protect us all. Zelensky is mad because he's not getting the same treatment. 
He's saying by defending the free, uh, by defending Israel, the free world has demonstrated that this kind of unity is not only possible but completely effective. The same is possible in protecting Ukraine from terror, which, like Israel, is not a NATO member. And he does have a point. And this does not require activation of Article 5. Only political will is enough, he said. But of course, this was a red line for Russia. This is why we don't do it, right? The IAEA Director General expresses concern over the possibility of Israel attacking Iran's nuclear facilities. Iranian government informed inspectors that facilities will remain closed for security reasons. Stay tuned for future developments. Now, Again, he's saying that, but you're not hearing it on the news anywhere, okay? Uh, because, of course, he's on our side. What else do we got here? Oh, the bills that are about to be passed this week. Apparently, Mike Johnson is about to separate them so they can ensure that Israel gets its money, knowing full well that Ukraine might not get its money, okay? Okay. Majority Speaker of the House Mike Johnson announced that he will introduce three separate bills for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan on the floor. So we're going to see where all the priorities lie. There's also another bill that might include a ban of TikTok and a bill to sell seized Russian assets and a lend lease Act for military aid and convertible loans for humanitarian relief. So they're going to frame it as a loan. Look, loan what? You're in debt, $35 trillion. What are we going to loan? And as if we are going to expect to get it back. I mean, just loan out, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good racket to say, well, we'll just loan out the money. Well, when Ukraine collapses, who's going to pay it back? Uh, the fire season is already starting in Canada. Explosive fires are expected this year. We already have a fire burning in Saskatchewan, which is 23,000 acres big. Last year, I believe we hit, was it 1.7 million? Or no, was it? I can't even remember. It was like in the millions of, of hectares burned. So no matter how you slice it, hard times are coming. Now, the closer you are to ground zero, you got to look at the rule of threes. Little, you know prepping advice for you at the end of this long-winded rant. You got to look at the rule of threes. So the closer you are, like if I was in Israel, I would be prioritizing. So the rule of threes, if you don't know, three seconds without security, meaning it takes three seconds for you to get shot, three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, three days without water, three weeks without food. And again, you know, some people will, will last much longer than that. Some, you know, won't last as long, but that's just a ballpark. It's just an easy uh, mnemonic device to, to, to remember stuff. And uh, what was the other one? Three months without government, you know, three years without, I don't know, three, maybe three months without community, three years without government. I, you can make stuff up, okay? The point is, is that the closer you are to ground zero, the, the closer you are to the beginning of the rule of threes. So, you know, your survival is dependent on that split second you have to get into the bunker or that split second if you're in a war zone. Okay, so that's the three second rule. Next to that is air. Now, air, of course, is in terms of prepping is going to involve CBRN. So that's going to be your hazmat suit, your gas mask, your uh, powered air purifier system, things we've shown you on the channel several times before, your uh, filters that you would put on that gas mask. Now, if you're new to this channel, what you want is a gas mask that has a 40 millimeter threading so that you can put, that's a standardized size for NATO gas mask filters. You can get them at canadianpreparedness.com. We sell a variety of different types of gas masks from different uh, levels in terms of expense and uh, capability and different types of filters. You can get filters that are just going to filter out particulates, filters that have an activated charcoal component, filters that have a carbon monoxide neutralizing component, um, riot control agents, chemicals, uh, CBRN. Full CBRN means chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear. Now moving up from that, the further you are from ground zero, like if you're here in North America preparing right now, I'm thinking about things further down the supply chain. So I'm not thinking so much 
about the CBRN gear, I already have that. I'm thinking about what are things that are required to buy this very complex, intricate global supply chain. So big stuff that might, we might see a bit of a supply glut with right now, capitalize on any deal you can get. Anybody who's saying 15% off, 25% off, capitalize on it now. Because if Israel attacks Iran, they open Pandora's box. Because if Israel attacks Iran, and they do it in a way which is explosive, and clearly with the intent of provoking the Iranians into a much bigger response, and you know our media is not going to frame it that way. They're going to say, well, Israel was just retaliata retaliating, and, you know, and so it's going to be blamed on Iran when they respond, and that's what they want, the big Iranian response, okay, the 500 to 1,000 missiles, so they can get all the optics they need for this thing to just go absolutely berserk. And when that happens, everything could just quickly start to tumble. Uh, prices could start to skyrocket. And all of that stuff that we get made, manufactured overseas, could become a lot more expensive. And uh, this is why, going back to the three-second rule, those things that might require you know, that might, you might not need right away, but you still do need to survive. Things like food, okay? Things like shelter. I mean, maybe it's not the best example because shelter, three hours, but really, you know, the shelter could be a bit of a three-month rule as well because just the tools that you need to survive. Things like uh, equipment, off-grid, homestead-type equipment. These are things that may not be available. I mean, they weren't available during the pandemic everything was skyrocketing in price because things simply weren't being made anymore. So whatever you couldn't find in the pandemic is probably going to be much worse if World War III really starts to turn into a full-blown shooting match, a kinetic World War III. I'm hoping that the Israelis limit their response to some sort of cyber attack, but it's yet to be seen whether or not that is going to be a red line for the Iranians. I suspect that if they get wind that Israel is going to do some massive cyber attack, that they're not going to, you know, allow that to happen. And they're going to respond in a very similar way. Either way, this thing's going to blow up. It's going to get bad. It's going to get ugly. Capitalize on every single day, okay, from this point forward. And just be thankful every single day when we have another normal day when you can just go out to the park and not worry about stuff. All right, I think I've rambled on long enough today. If you need any survival gear that you see behind here, go check out CanadianPreparedness.com. We get you the best deals. We try to have the best service. We're doing our best in terms of responding to people's emails, phone calls. We're a smaller operation, but we're trying to grow and uh, we try to get you the best shipping. I mean, I look at the Amazon packaging of packages and compared to our stuff, you know, it's far more discreet and it's just the packing on the products when we send you them. It is really robust and we make sure that uh, you're gonna get your stuff and it's not gonna be damaged. So check it out while supplies are still around. Thanks for watching guys.